Well, hello, everyone. Hello, hello, hello. We are so excited to be back with you again tonight uh, for a great discussion uh, on the Black intellectualism movement. Um, I am so excited to have our guest tonight, who is Mr. Jonathan Polidor, or if you look him up, um, according to his work, you will see Sean Polidor, S-E-A-N. Um, I want to thank him so much for taking time tonight to come and hang out with us. You guys, we have um, opened up two hours of action-packed conversation to talk with you all um, just about author life, um, community, advocacy, writing. First, we'll be talking about everything, basically. <laughs> do what we always do. <laughs> do what we always do. And I want to start by kind of telling you guys how I first met Jonathan and yeah kind of how we've just had an ongoing relationship that's been building in a tremendous way since the first time we met. The first time we met, I was down in Lafayette. Um, I had crossed paths with, um, I, I forgot the lady's name. Yvonne, Yvonne uh, Duhall. The lady named Miss Yvonne. Yvonne and she, she invited me to be on their show in Lafayette. So yes. I drove down to Lafayette, and I think that night was my birthday maybe. Or something yeah, was. was going on. It was. It was. So, yeah. And we. And then look, my birthday is like nine days away now. So it was around this time, two years Man. ago. <laughs> look how that. It's look how that works. Full circle. Yes. Look how yes. that works. So, so we're coming around full circle. So it was around my birthday then, and we had. This, that was my first time meeting Jonathan. And sure. first of all, his energy was so magnetic. The questions he asked were so awesome. It was so refreshing because they really dug into the core of the writing experience and author life and black intellect. And I had a ball. And when we finished, yeah. he showed so much love and positivity. <laughs> and, you know, he just made me feel like a million dollars. And I oh, appreciate that so much. And then we just kept in touch. We've been in touch yeah. since then. We've Thanks. talked about me coming to Lafayette, him coming up here. So we're trying to make it through this pandemic, but we both have yeah. the same mission, which is to share words of hope and inspiration worldwide as authors and speakers. Yeah. And so yeah. that's been like one of the most beautiful things that I just get so excited to uh, also hear his wisdom as a black man who is sharing so much knowledge with our younger people and com committed, inspired, educated, well-versed, has had just so many different experiences in life. And um, so he, he, it was so crazy because I had been thinking about Jonathan for a while. He messaged me about yeah. coming on to uh, do an interview. And I was yeah. like, I've been thinking about messaging you. And I said, I had actually written it down for us to get in touch. So we were like, well, why don't we team up and do like a back-to-back -back interview? And I was like, yeah. I think that would be awesome. So that's what we're doing tonight is we're doing a back-to-back -back interview. We'll be talking about a lot of things. Please drop your questions in the comments. Please like and share tonight's discussion. Um, if you're tuning in from my personal page, the business page, Jonathan should be able to share this on his page in a minute, or I share it on there, LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter, and we're trying to get Instagram up and running. Um, tap in, tap in. We're trying to hit every outlet, period. So what happened last night was something I really enjoyed when I actually kind of let the guests introduce themselves and their platforms. And so I would like to do that same thing. And since Jonathan and I are doing back-to-back, uh, after he introduces himself, then I'll introduce myself as well. And then I guess um, we'll let Jonathan kick off with the talking. Oh, okay. 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 First of all, most, I want to say thank you for allowing me to come on your wonderful platform. I love what I see going on here. I know that these things are not easy to spearhead. They're not easy to keep it going with the content. And you're carrying that torch and doing that work, my sister. So first and foremost, represent that. I want to appreciate that, right? Um, so to answer the question, they call me Sean P. Sean Polador, born and raised Franklin, Louisiana. 14 years public speaking, uh, five times self-published author, three yes. times number one uh, Amazon release. Yes. Um, Three audio books in the chamber. Yes. More than anything else, I love to teach, inspire, motivate, inform the community. Anybody, but more so my community, my culture, my people. So 
it doesn't really matter what the genre is. I love teaching and instructing. So yes. that's kind of sort of my bread and butter in a nutshell. Yes. I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, and of course, I'm Jamie Mays, um, author and speaker, um, host of the Black Intellectualism Movement. I have written seven books. Um, and um, as they say, as he says, I have some in the chamber, which means I have some I'm still working on. Which that's that's always the the, the whole yeah, it's, it's issue, right? <laughs> um, I've been really blessed uh, to have spoken at hundreds of events with over 22 years in the game as a speaker. Um, and my mission is just simply, as Jonathan said, to spread words of hope and inspiration with the world, and to further increase um, Black intellectualism and and conversations about um, the beauty of Black culture as it relates to the world and how we fit into the necessity of American and worldwide history um, and by pushing that conversation forward. So looking through uh, the life of Black people, looking through the lens of Black life through a, a, um, an integrated lens and not one that looks at us as a, a separate component of society, but as a necessary element of society, right? Mm. That the world does not function without um, the, the life that Black people give to it. So, um, yeah. I, that, I that's that. it, you I know. That. I love that. I love how you said that. I want to share something with the family, right quick. You mentioned the first time we ever met on Arthur's Corner, right? Yeah, I brag, I brag about your show to this day because prior to your episode, we had done I don't know how many episodes of Arthur Corner, and all respect to every single guest we had, all praises, all that good stuff. But whenever you came on that show, it was evident. Your claw you was cut from, it was evident your oh, acumen, yes. your study, your skill set. Because you mentioned the questions I asked, I asked some similar questions to every guest, and most of them had real shallow answers because that skill set, that depth, that meat wasn't there inside of them. They just put a book together. <laughs> but whenever I'm asking you, whenever I'm asking you these questions. And the answers you was coming with, I'm sitting there getting excited like a little kid. I'm like, and then whenever we left, I call all my friends like, bro, tonight you should have seen the whole girl. You should have seen the whole girl last night, bro. <laughs> she was going in. It was like, you see, I'm like, bro, you got to go and see it. Thank you, Sean. Like you had, you you had that kind of an impact on me. Thank and you talking about the the amount of years you've been speaking and the amount of venues you've been to and the, the amount of writing and even your educational background in this. I always bow and give thanks and, and give praises to what you do because oh, do not you know, do that. I'm the I'm the, I'm the I'm the little brother in the space. I'm I'm, I'm the little homie in the space. You know no, do not do that. You know I bust out crying, and we are always, always, always colleagues in this space. And you know I think we move in different realms, at different paces, in different spaces. We're doing different things, but as long as we have the mission to move forward in greatness. Um, I think the family of, of, of black intellects is always very strong. And I love, and I don't... I love that title, the black intellectual movement, man, because Thank you know why? You. I'm a historian. I didn't mention that part to my story. I love, matter of fact, I'm wearing the hoodie right now to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, right? Yes. On day yes. as we speak, you see what it is. But yes. I yes. love studying our history and our greatness and our people. And you go to the Marcus Garvey UNIA movement. You go to the, the Muslim National, uh, you know, Nation of Islam movement. You go to the Morris Science Temple. You go to the Black Panther Party and a lot of other movements. They were all based on intellect. They were all based on a pillar of foundational knowledge of our history and our greatness. And how do we apply that to today's situations? So whenever I see the title of the Black Intellectual Movement, I want to be a part of something like that. I want to tap into something like that. I, I that think it's so. That reminds me of what I used to read about. And well, thank you. And, and and honestly, that was one of the greatest missions of trying to coin a phrase because initially this started off with me just hosting a com couple of conversations about things that had been resonating with my spirit, and um, that people had asked me to discuss because um, I would go live all the time. So I was like, well, let me just do a couple of these discussions. And once I started hosting them. The feedback that I started to get was so tremendous and the feedback was coming from everywhere, like people 
who didn't live primarily people that didn't even live where I lived who were saying I tuned in last night and you killed it and you talked about this and you talked about that or I watched the replay and I started to get people that were not from the area I lived in but people I knew from back in the day who were saying anytime you need a guest about this topic or that topic or this topic let me know and so at that point I was like okay I think we run into something that's that's more than what I anticipated right and so I always think back to the Harlem Renaissance movement. I, I go love back the Harlem Renaissance. The Harlem I Renaissance love that era. time period. All the time. No. Right, at all times. And I, all, I also recently have been very reflective of the uh, post-slavery period, those 12 yep. years where we had the, what was the reconstruction going on. Reconstruction. And the mere fact yep. that the reconstruction era came to a short end because the power of black intellectualism was so strong. It did not come to any end for any other reason other than because the power of black intellectualism was so strong. They literally said, these Negroes are doing too much. <laughs> they have doing been the to most. politics. Doing they have the been to grad school. They have, they have found a way to use the non-pennies they get paid to purchase mm -hmm. land. They are really, they're building their own schools. And mm -hmm. that's what really cut that period back. And so I was like, we don't get the chance to look at black history and black culture. Like every time we talk about it, it's in this limited lens of putting us in a box, but we really are such a necessary part of the functionality of the world. So the goal of the black intellectualism movement is to continue to bring forth black conversations that are not just about impacting the black community, but about the world coming in contact with meaningful uh, projects and work and black intellects who are doing some really powerful things. I'm sorry. Let me let me let me pick let me piggyback on what you said a little bit, right? Yes, so before the pandemic, right here in Lafayette, Louisiana, there was a spot called the Black Element by my sister Shannon Ozen. Phenomenal, right? Black owned spot, got all the black books, got your sage and your herbs, got your crystals and stones, the whole nine. But I would go there and host uh speaking engagements all the time. Mm -hmm. I would host community discussions all the time. Right. And guess what, friend? Don't you find out? In the middle of all the craziness on social media that you see, there is still a pocket of people that want black intellect. Mm -hmm. We want to have intelligent dialogues and debates mm -hmm. and conversations. Mm -hmm. We want to mm -hmm. discuss things that we can never normally say at work. Yes. You can never normally say yes. at the Thanksgiving table with your family. You can yes. never normally say it to your spouse. Yes. But in this safe space, we're discussing our real issues. Mm -hmm. We're not fussing and fighting. We're not being disrespectful. But we all sharpen each other's swords. And guess what, friend? We will be there for hours after yes. the event. Yes. Like the vibe was so high, the vibe was so pure and good. People just want to exchange information afterwards. And man, you do this, I do that. Man, you in that certain business, man, so and so in the same rank. People connected. That's what it was all about. Yes. You said Hall of Renaissance. I said for four years or more in Lafayette, that could be a renaissance. We have enough writers. In the area, we have enough people that make T-shirts and hoodies and clothing in the area. We have yep. enough artists, musical artists and painters in yes. the area. We can have our own rebirth, our own renaissance, and we yes. will all just unite and yes. stop backbiting. Yes. Now yes. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Uh, yeah. Yes. See, see, I did that. And I see, think I did that. that. I think that we have a uh, we have a lot of things. I, I think that, and for me, one of the most difficult things is that we have a lot of things that are going on, but unfortunately, as we continue to learn, the positivity about Black communities and Black energy and Black excellence does not get as much attention as the negativity oh. does, and that's of course oh, been orchestrated by design, right? Yeah. And yeah. so I feel that there's always a need for people like you and I, or you and me, who have great ambitions to do what we can to advance the movement of positive Black voices. Because there is so much out there that we continue to hear about that, that tries to negate the excellence that Black people possess. Let me so, tell you what I would... Mm -hmm, go ahead. Let me tell you what I would do, friend. Look what I would do. I would get a big speaking engagement at a big, you know, venue. Mm -hmm. You know, suit and tie, hard bottom shoes. Mm -hmm. The whole bells and whistles, right? I would do a presentation mm -hmm. over there. I would do the same as that presentation in the hood at the Black Element. Uh -huh. I'm bringing the same thing to my people. Uh -huh. And we're doing the same presentation our way. Yeah. 
I refuse to do something of that magnitude and just give it to those people. No, we getting yeah. it too. Open yeah. them doors up. Come on, yeah. bring your kids and everything. We're going to learn over here too. Yeah. I made it a habit to do that every chance I could. But, you know, and it's so funny that you said that um, because I remember I used to have conversations all the time about, um, and this is kind of going to the left but coming back to the right. I used to have people that would always say, have these conversations, you know, well, why did you why did you go to a school that's a PWI? Why did you do this? Why did you do that? I said, because I understand this, the element of knowledge is something that's valuable um, when you get it and you need to be passing it on to our kids so that they can have a sense of strength and courage. Uh, and wisdom. I said, it doesn't matter where you get it from. It matters what you're doing with it, right? Yes. So if I'm gathering knowledge, regardless of where I'm gathering it from, but I'm not bringing it back to uplift and empower the next generation of children who look like me, I am not doing my job. Regardless of where you get it from, if you are not passing it along to someone who looks like you, who who can be moved forward in a great way, you're not doing your job. Because on the on the backside of black intellectualism, right? Don't you have the Carter G. Woodson miseducation of a Negro whenever he was talking about sometimes some of the most educated of us do the least for our community. Ooh. <laughs> Step on some toes right quick. Some of the most educated of us do the least. I don't care if you went to Howard. I don't care if you went to Southern Grambling. I don't care if you went to Texas Southern. If you're not doing anything for the community in which you came from or where you currently reside, Go to a PWI. You might as well. You you might as about, well. <laughs> you've talked about classism. Basically, what you brought up just now is classism, and it's so ironic that you brought up classism because on yesterday I was having that conversation. Um, I, I brought up the question with some of our politicians, and I brought that conversation up again, uh, just about the fact that uh, we have this, um, like a. I just had a brain fart for a minute, like a responsibility to ensure that. Um, I just had a whole brain for it. <laughs> you, you, you made the statement about um, it, regardless of where we're going, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And what else did you say? I, I was saying our Carter G. Wilson said some of the most educated of us do the absolute least for the community. That's it. No matter where you went to school. Talking about classism. That's it. I'm so <laughs> Look, I told you I've been thinking all day. You that good. when we get you. to this certain place where we have arrived, right? Sometimes we start to believe that it separates us from our own people. And I tell people all the time, let me tell you something. Regardless of what neighborhood you get to, don't forget the neighborhood you came from because you can always end up back there. Needing the help of the people you thought you were too good for. Come on. And the one thing that Come I always on. think about is um, that I grew up in the housing projects um, in, in my hometown. Uh, okay. I grew up in the housing projects, and we talked to my poor enough where we didn't even have a car. Okay, grew up without a car. Uh, we didn't have much. I have a poem I wrote called Put It On Bricks, which is about when I was so for broke and we were so poor, my mom had to put the couch on bricks. And especially in recent years, as I have continued to pray and have watched God open doors, I, I humbly always pray, please, Lord, do not let me get so full of myself that I lose sight of the people who are still in the place where I came from. What does it be so... Uh, people who, who supported and inspired me, I would not be able right. to go where I have been. And I want to definitely bring more people who are where I was to a higher level. So but is that, it some of them, some of the folks get so heavily they are no earthly good? Them kind of people, baby. Huh? <laughs> huh? <laughs> yes, absolutely, absolutely. You see what I'm saying? And it happens. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to to bring up what uh, Miss Ever said. She said we need so much more black people that are willing to stand up and be positive for one another without so much judgment. Yeah, that is so real. That's yes. so so real. Because um, the minute the minute you try to turn that leaf over. And do something positive for the community. Do a blood drive. Do a back to school program. Do haircuts for kids when school come around. People got so much negative to say. Yeah, yeah. But if I had a little booster concert tonight, <laughs> now all the cars in the parking lot, you can't get in the parking lot <laughs> because Jay Z had a Jay Z had a song right. 
And I, I ain't going to curse, I ain't gonna curse on your channel, but Jay Z's song is called. <laughs> oh, let's do it then. Jay Z's song is called Ignorant Shit, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. basically, he's saying, like, we love ignorant shit. Whenever I tried to rap about something that was intellectual, I tried to rap about something that was higher thinking, y'all said I fell off. But whenever I rap about when I rap about money, cars, and hoes and clothes, now I'm a billionaire. But because y'all, y'all like ignorant. We love ignorant shit. Let me tell you something, and that's why I think that we also have to be better about because I believe that a large part. So let let's talk about that part, okay? Because I will say this. I will say this. It also has to get to a point where you are willing to stay true. And I know that we love Jay Z, and well, people love Jay Z. You know, I don't have any beef with him. I'll, I'll make um, an example. Yeah. I think he's pretty good. No, no, no. But but this is like it's no beef with loving him. You know, he has done some great things, and he and Beyonce have built some wonderful things together. But one of the things that I've had to learn over the years is that we also have to teach our children to understand exactly what your purpose is attached to, right? And so people say now I'm a billionaire, but I think about people like um, J. Cole, uh, who is a profound rapper that may not have the same amount of money, but after years of staying true to himself, have been able to have some really acclaimed fame. Yeah. Now, does it give you the same attention that you see other rappers out there getting, you know, who have been on P. Diddy's level and, and Master P level, make them say, oh, nah, 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 you know, yeah. and all the yeah. stuff they were talking about, yeah. you know, I told you yeah. I'm the colonel, the, you know, and they talk about shit. No, yeah. it hasn't. Yeah. But what we, we do know that. is people who are born on a much a higher spirit level of thinking, you know, the people who, who live in that spirit realm, is that that will not always be the thing that grabs the most attention because, right. unfortunately, people by nature have an interest in the superficial. Right. And so when do we make the choice to continue to stay true to the calling versus staying true to the dollar? Let, let me tell you, friend, this is good with black intellectualism. See that one title alone. We can spend 20 minutes already on just the title of this show by itself. Yes. That's, how, that's, how, that's how deep it is. Right. This conversation. Yeah, that's it. It is. It is. Let me, let, let, let me tell you, friend, I'm connected to a lot of OGs mm -hmm. in the area. Mm -hmm. and they see what I'm doing, what I've been doing. Mm -hmm. They see me on the front lines, they see my page, they see what I post, mm -hmm. everything, right? Mm -hmm. For most black intellectuals, there's always this fork in the road that comes. Right. right. Where it's like, look, you're going to get your PhD and all your degrees and get your all that, and get the white picket fence and mm -hmm. be in the suburbs away from your people because you made it, at quotations. Mm -hmm. Or you're going to be boots on the ground on the front of the line, but you got to also know that there is no dollar amount coming behind that. Right. Also know that your own people are not going to back you on that choice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whenever you're getting, you know, uh, uh, slandered and everything happening to you and your family and your name getting drugged through the mud, maybe you're getting fired from jobs, all kinds of stuff happen when you, when you take that, that, that stance. You take that leap. Mm -hmm. You better know that you're taking that stance for the right reason. Exactly. And not for exactly. no popularity, not for no fame, exactly. not for no... It's not glamorous. It's look. I, I, I know some old activists from 1969. I know some old activists. It ain't... Mm -hmm. So you better know what you're doing when you're making these choices. Yep. That's what I would say. It, what you say is 100% true because let me tell you something. Nothing is more refreshing because I'll tell you, even as a as a woman who chose to um, go harder for my, for my calling and understanding that there were going to be some people who might have something to say. I was in the classroom and still being very true to what my beliefs were socially and things like that. And, and, and where I worked, you know what I'm like, outside of here, I do activism work. And so either you respect the activism I do for the kids that I teach who look like me and still struggle to get equal rights for the kids I also teach who don't look like me yep. or I'm not the person that you want. And thankfully, for the most part, I didn't have any kickback on it Bill, because people respected the fact that I'm not going to change what I believe and That's who I care about and my stance. And it's so interesting that you said that because let me tell you something. A couple of weeks ago, matter of fact, when my when my son won the talent show, 
we went we in a basic a pair, mixed environment. Um, and he had a black boy joy shirt on. Yep. And when I went to do this, um, went to get ready to take him, I was already kind of looking because I had had people before when I had performed in places. You know how you know how you know how I speak, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that would say, "Oh, that's just you know you you're gonna say that piece, or that's kind of rough." I even had an incident one time where they said when I left the room, somebody. I got one question. Go ahead. I got one question. Go ahead. The person asked you that question: Were they a black or a white person? They were actually black. I know it. I, I don't want to. I don't want. I don't want to assume. I don't want you to verbally say it. Keep going. Keep going. And so apparently, when I left, you know, folks were so offended because I did a, a piece that was, wasn't about offending anybody, but about my people. And um, when I got ready to put my son up in the Black Boy Joy T, I could already tell people were giving me side looks. But when my son got up to perform Langston Hughes. And give the background on him and represent in a shirt that made, when he saw that black boy joy shirt it made him feel like a million dollars first of all because he is a happy child and yes, he is. He's breaking yes. the 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 the, the yes. conversations of society that indicate that our kids are just you know aggressive by nature and when he stood on that stage he felt like a million dollars and ended up getting a tremendous ovation and at the end the number of people who ran over to talk about how infectious his personality was and how excited they were about the shirt. And even a teacher who said to me, who was who was not a black woman, I'm so thankful that you are teaching him such important pieces. This is a piece I also share with my students. Would you mind teaching it to him? Because I love to hear him perform it. I say that kind of statement to say this. We have got to get in a space where we don't feel, and, 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 and this is not criticizing us, because we still struggle with our identity because of the trauma our people have been through generationally. Of course, yes. Getting us yes. to a place where we are so comfortable in our skin that we do not feel shifted or uncomfortable by people who um, whose issue is more about how they feel threatened than, than having an issue with the statement we're making. And we've got to get to a place where we feel comfortable because guess what? When you feel comfortable about who you are, and feel comfortable about celebrating your culture. Everybody else will celebrate it with you. People will consider how you feel. People will support it. Even if they don't understand it, they will respect it. And you know and what I, else too, friend? Mm -hmm. we, have to, we have to always police our backyard and our front porch first before just the other people. Always. That's true. That's true. We got to be more consistent with our energy. Mm -hmm. And stop being right. fair with the people, right? Stop being yeah. emotional. What do I mean by that? Black Panther come out. Everybody and their mama wearing dashikis. Black Panther come out. I ain't seen some in the head rap since Eric Badu concert. Jill Scott. <laughs> All kind of big old earrings, right? Black Panther go, my goes outfit. away. My outfit was slayed, too. I'm not lying. I was Black, I just been funny a little bit, but Black Panther go away. Where's that same level of pride in our culture and our motifs and our signs and symbols every day? Now, George Floyd happens, Breonna Taylor happens, we can name a thousand names and we have all this energy, mm -hmm. all this uproar, mm -hmm. and it always fizzes out so fast. What a consistent, the consistent energy, the consistent work, the consistent effort, that same energy going out there, had that same energy at the school board meetings on Tuesday, right. Right. had that same right. energy at the doggone state capitol when they lobbying, had the same energy at the polls. But See, you people, know what? Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, one last thing. People always ask me on podcast showing what part do you think it is is the solution for our community? I always say it's a multi-prone problem and take a multi-prone solution. We always think that one part of the pie that we do is enough. Mm -hmm. Hey, I voted, I pressed the button, that's enough. No. Mm -hmm. Hey, I protested, I got pepper sprayed, bit by the dog, I did my part, that's enough. No, we need all the pie, not just a part of the pie. So let me ask you a question, okay? Yeah, one of the yeah. conversations that I consistently have is that I think one of my concerns now is that we have dropped the ball on teaching effective leadership and yeah. Yeah. civil rights advocacy to the next yeah. generation. Yeah. So check this up. Because, yeah. because the young people, yeah. the students I taught, they are off the chain, okay? 
they are taking i don't know how many people on this on this stream or on TikTok, but that's one of the conversations i have if you ever get on TikTok and watch the young people the young generation is not playing they are not trying to hear you okay and and sometimes i'm like woo, y'all need to slow down you're going to like <laughs> but i feel that the young generation has the attitude we need they have the audacity we need they but do. we have not done a good job of teaching them what the steps are so that you have to take this fight you have to the capital you have to know how to organize so you are taking on leadership positions you have to know how to be a civil rights leader you have mm. we haven't done our part because friend. we got so small you know by by not having to do what our grandparents did friend back to the black intellectual we could put all night on this we didn't even get to the first question yet we just we just we just going in right because look at this i've been saying this for years right Yes. Why would ever hypothetically? Why would never Donald Trump get into the to the office, right? Mm -hmm. To represent us, you have Kanye West, Ray Lewis, Steve Harvey, who was with the uh, uh, Jim Brown, right? So what? you mean you mean the best of our best to go up here and advocate for us or entertainers? But understand, but this. the old that days, yeah, that actual that doctors, a, right? lawyers, PhDs. Right. People that's actually a uh, civil rights activist, they go right. into the White House. They go into the, uh, the, the the state capitol and all that. But now we got Nicki Minaj going to talk about the whole vaccine thing. But well, wait a minute. But hold, hold on. In our so entertainers? Decision, entertainers not, are the best that was, But that was not by our choice. And especially when you talk about the thing with, with Donald Trump that I really had beef with was because he unfortunately chumped us up to being nothing more than people who could be swayed by entertainers. That's what I'm trying to and, say. And that's, that's the only I'm value he saw with us. And we, I felt like we did a decent job of saying, oh, that's who you want to bring to represent yeah. us? No, sir. I, I don't see that, no other culture do that. Yeah. I, I think that we had to be more, I wanted us to be more aggressive about saying you should be calling uh, Bakari Selder. I mean, I Bakari know Selder. We, 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 and they know did that. a great job speaking up. We know but as so. far as us really pushing them into the White House and having to have that conversation, these people cannot do it alone. They went into the places where they were welcome, like CNN, NBC, you know, Good Morning America. But right. we should have been able to, and I and I think that's that's that learning curve, right? We should have been able to advocate more for them to be the voices that actually got in there to hold him accountable on those conversations. And we were not we we were not able to no. to kind of convey that. That you're not going to water us down as so, a culture. You're not going to water us down as a people. You are going to respect that we do have valuable intellects that can hold a conversation with you. And if you're scared of them, that indicates that there is a problem. There's a problem, right? So, there's so, a problem. You know, like like you just said, man, I'm always looking like we have so many of our intellects in all of these individual spaces. Mm -hmm. And they never get that phone call. Yeah. Because the yeah. powers that be know if we call them, it's gonna be yeah. it's gonna be trouble. It's gonna be a wrap. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So let, let, let's call Megan the Stay in to come in here. Let's call <laughs> Cardi B to come in here. Let's call so and so. And not saying nothing shade on those particular people, but that's not your life work. Right. That's right. Not your calling. Right. right. You shot a joke, shot your whole life, and now you got millions of dollars, and you famous. You put a microphone in front of your face. What's your What's your thoughts on this? Right, and we expect right. some profound thing to come out of their mouth, which right. is not fair to them. Right. To be honest, that's not fair to them. Right, but the black intellectual, we have come so far to where we don't idolize the black intellectual. We don't, we don't admire the black intellectual. Most of us going to school. I know when I was in school, I didn't admire my school librarian. I didn't admire the principal. I didn't even admire my <laughs> coaches. It was cool. Did I didn't want to. I didn't want to beat him. I did not admire my school librarian. <laughs> I did. I didn't. But they were cool. I just didn't yeah. want to beat them. Yeah. We wanted yeah. to be athletes, yeah. rappers, you yeah. know, dope boys. I mean, you know, classic, you know, eighties, nineties stuff. <laughs> That's what the apparatus. And so to this day, right now, we go into these schools trying to motivate these kids and inspire them and spark them. They want these trinkets. That's attractive. Yeah. Well, I so think we got we got we got we got to combat 
that kind of goes into the whole idea when you talk about that. One reason you're not motivated by the school librarian is because she's getting a raggedy teacher's paycheck. Who's motivated by somebody who's that's what I'm saying? Not match, yeah, does not match that's what the, I'm saying. the you know the financial component that we believe is associated with success, right? Let's let, let, let's do it like this. I mentioned some guys early in the podcast about black intellectualism. You know the sad part about them guys? They had to do a fish fry to bury most of those guys. Couldn't even bury them. Yeah. The guys yeah. that we uphold yeah. so much, and we say their name and where their hood is, and we quote their books on our little our little memes, we couldn't even bury those guys. Do you know what is so crazy about this statement? Let me tell you what's so crazy about Come this on, statement man. you were making. That poor righteous <laughs> teacher thing is dead, bro. A few years ago, um, uh, so I, I have had the chance to do uh, to speak for the nation of Islam out here in Monroe. I've had the chance to speak to speak, speak for them on several occasions. They have been very supportive of my work. Um, I have Good. a great relationship with them. Some of them may be tuned in tonight. That, that's how Good. they are Shout very out. true to the game. Shout out. And um, at yeah. one time I had, and I, I should have had this man's name together, but they have a leader that comes out of, I think, Houston. Uh, that is one of the top leaders in line. And I'll never forget that he came into a session where I spoke and another young man from the community spoke. And his statement to us was, you, this community has two of the most amazing young leaders I've ever seen. And I've traveled a lot and they are very powerful and they are smart, but you all are going to suck them dry in this community and leave them broke. Because you want them to do the work, but you do not want to support them. See what I'm saying? This, I wasn't even there. I wasn't even there. Let me tell you something. I wasn't even there. Let me tell you something. And this <laughs> was even, like six or I seven years this, ago this man I've been said this. this. I've been saying this for years, man. Read about how much money, how much money Malcolm X had when he died. Go and look it up somewhere. Go Google it. Yep. Look at when Dr. Dr. John Henry Clark died. Whenever Dr. Ben Joe Look at just last year, Dr. Renoko, but this year, I'm sorry, Dr. Renoko Rashidi passed a few months ago. Yep. And these guys on all these DVDs, they got all their signs and symbols all over the country in New York, Philadelphia, Chicago. We can't bury these guys. Yep. And their families left down bad. We're going to quote Dr. Clark. Yep. Look, and, and we'll on, never man. stop and we'll never stop quoting these intellects. And let me tell you something. Oh. Let me tell you something. When this man said this to me on that night, as a matter of fact, I had had, I think I had given birth to my son. Um, and when he said that on that night, he changed my life. He yeah. changed my life because at that point, I think I had written three books. And I was always saying my mission is to be able to share my work all over the world. But when he said that, that changed my life because this is why. I said, how is it that I plan to end generational poverty in my family? If I am out here doing the groundwork, but nobody is willing to ensure that both me and my child are fed, and and not and I and, and not and not noodles and wieners, Friend, for the kind of advocacy it. I'm willing to do, we deserve more, right? He changed let's, my life that night. He really let's, did. Let's bring a back door conversation to the living room right now. You ain't got to say nothing. If you sit back if you want, I'm gonna go ahead and say it. So they got to say, boy, Jamie, wrong for that. Sean P gonna say it. You and I both go to these schools and speak to these kids, right? Go yes, sit back. Go ahead, go ahead, get your little drink, sip on. We go to these schools, we go to these organizations, we go to the jail, we go to the churches, and y'all don't want to pay us. Not what we deserve. Not a dime. This woman got seven books. This woman got all kinds of accolades. She degreed up, resume looking stellar. And you don't want to pay her what she deserves, but you're going to pay somebody from somewhere else? The bag? Yes. And not yes. somebody in your own backyard? Yes. That's stuff that we yes. deal with. And guess what? It's not free. It's not cheap. Yes. It's not free. Yes. Everything I was yes. spitting and quoting, guess where that came from? I had to buy books yes. to read them. Yes. Everything I'm spitting, guess yes. where that came from? I had to yes. pay for uh, webinars and certifications. I had yes. to fly myself across the country and go to yes. different things. But you want me to go speak to the kids for lunch? Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to go speak to your kids for a t-shirt? For a photo op? Did I, did I say too much? For, no, you didn't. No. Should, I, should, 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 should I stop? What? No, you should not. Because, but because you want me. You and you I are not me. the only people that go through this battle and through this fight. 
You and, want me to and, die and, like Malcolm? And, 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 and let me tell you something. I had to put some parameters in place because God had to have a conversation with me, and He said, "Peace." Was that the? He said, "Okay." Was that degree free? No. The nights that you spent no. up studying, was it free? No. You work 60 to 80 hours a week teaching, plus you give up your weekends and your summers to pursue your passion. Is it free? No. He said, if you really believe in me and believe in who I am and who I've called you to be, why are you devaluing the gift I've given to you? People like, like, and I had to make some some real hard changes. But we're talking about very recently still enduring those same issues where people absolutely say, well, um, all we got is a uh, uh, hundred. And I'm watching, I put a post up not too long ago. Um, it was actually a TikTok reel where I said, um, people call you and say that all you can do is sell your books at the event where nobody buys them. And then they sell tickets for $40 a pop and say they can't pay you. And it's a, a it's a legit conversation a because they'll they'll say you know you you touching me you changed my life and and then by all means we show up because we have the passion but we work let me tell y'all something Jonathan on average reads one to two books a week and I read a lot too but I don't get to read nearly as much as he does this man reads one to two books a week okay yeah he's yeah. always sharing podcasts he's always listening to information he's always studying. I have a mentor that I know for a fact listens to at least a podcast per day. Oh yeah. In order to study and and learn and remaster and bring forth these things that are important, we are constantly on a training ground. I go to workshops. I'm always watching YouTube. I'm always revisiting my work. As a matter of fact, I'm currently remastering. I'm on the fourth book in my collection that I'm remastering while simultaneously writing two while coaching other people through their projects. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? And, and, and for people to believe that it's just like we wake up and it happens, it doesn't happen like that. No. Because, and when you're really, really passionate about the calling, about the knowledge, when you're really passionate about it, you ensure you the, the amount of actual sleep you get is not very much because you want to ensure not only that you're filling yourself with knowledge, but whoever you're speaking and working with, that we're yeah. giving you what you need to be set free yeah. and to go to another level and to live this life in a different way. It takes a lot of work. For those that don't oh, know, that's, that, 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 that's new to me. For the past few months, I've been doing a string of author interviews almost every Friday. Matter of fact, I did one this yep. morning. About yep. five hours ago, I had a two, hour, two and a half hour interview, right? You did so, two today. <laughs> I said in that interview, I don't get paid for doing this. No, he doesn't. Mm -hmm. In fact, it costs me money because every author I'm interviewing, I got to go and buy their work. I got to go buy their work to be able to read it. I got to buy these tripods I'm using. I got to go buy these lights I'm using. Mm -hmm. I got to mm -hmm. buy other technology that we got to use. Mm -hmm. That's not free. It's mm -hmm. costing me money to do this, what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah. But you're seeing costs. I'm not getting you, a check for this. some facts. You are dropping some facts. A lot mm -hmm. of people don't. People, I've had people to ask me. This. I've had people to ask me, you know, how are you streaming in all these different places? How are you doing this? How are you doing that? This streaming service I'm paying for right now is currently $45 a month. And I've okay. had people come back to me there and say, is. I didn't know you had to pay for it. I said, do you understand that the that honest that honestly, this is this the thing that the passion is gonna cost you. The calling is gonna cost you. And when you decide that you're gonna step out there on your own because you know that there's an audience and a group of people that has not been reached, and you have a message that is not being put in a place where it needs to be yet, you have to step out there on faith and do what you need to do. So understand that you make the investment because it's necessary. But when you show up to places and people say, I value what you do. I value your gift. Thank you so much for what you do. But you don't put your money where your mouth is. I don't know anybody that's clocking into a job, but not receiving a paycheck on Friday. And we have now, to do better about our people. We like not wanna, just us, our people, period, that are in this entrepreneurial uh, yeah. realm. We got to. You want to you hear okay. something that's scary? You want to hear something that's scary, people? You know who do pay us and cut the check? You know who do pay for our travel? Do no, don't say it. Don't say it. I mean, it's not my platform. Tell me when to stop. I will get you in trouble. Don't say it. No, you know what? We're going we go, we go, we to change the top. We're going to change the top. All right, here we go. My first question for tonight. <laughs> Segway. My first question for tonight. You ready? 
because this is not where I thought we were going. Because you got, but we are speaking all facts tonight. Like you, you have really hit on some things tonight that are very important conversations, and our conversations that we have in private. Oh yeah, this, 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 this is all the but time. I don't get to hit the public with because yeah. understand this. I know a chick right now. There's a chick on my timeline, Sade Johnson. Okay. Sade has decided to transitioning into she makes some fantastic soaps. Amazing. I, I've been I've been I've been marking my calendar because I'm like, sis, I'm coming to ensure that for as long as you are doing things, I am supporting you. I am supporting a black businesswoman who is out here doing what she has to do. Sade said that over the course of two or three days this week, she made 60 bars of soap by hand. Ooh. By hand. That's for the price that she sells yeah. her products here in Louisiana, if you cross the line and go to these bigger cities, they're hitting you for eight to ten dollars a bar. And this woman is staying up day in, day out with these products because she is driven by passion. She can tell you everything that's in it. She can tell you how it's gonna help you. She can tell you what it's made of. She can tell you all types of things about it. And so we we cannot continue to say. That we believe in people, we believe in the dreamer, want to see black business thrive, but we don't do things that help to move black business people forward who are putting in the real work. Because we've got to do that. You know, like, trust me, man, hitting them up for $25 a month to support is not going to pay the full rent for them, but it's going to help them move that it's, it's a and you and know what? Move that work forward. And it's I mentioned way. I mentioned the black element earlier in the conversation, right? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. It's the past this conversation. You know why? What? People not going there patronizing. Right. So we want to say, oh, we got finally a black space. Mm -hmm. But y'all don't want to go in there and buy no books. You don't want to go in there and buy no shea butter. You don't want right. to go in there and just donate to the sister. You don't want to go in there and just say, man, I see what you're doing. It's needed for the community. Man, take this, whatever that might be you can do. So whenever I did speak over there, I made a point to stop my speech. Look, before y'all leave, y'all y'all go and patronize and get something. No patronize, yes. Go yes. buy a t-shirt, go do something. Before we leave tonight, you having a good okay. vibe right now, that's cool. But before you leave, go and get something. Yes. And the second thing, on the author's corner, guess what? I met one of my best friends in the world. His name is Keith Nickerson here in the Lafayette area. Mm -hmm. He about 62, 63 years old. My first time meeting that man, I went to his house. He had a table with books like that. He already had written 13 books when I met that man. 13 books. Books okay. this big. Not no little small books. That man writing tone. <laughs> right? Big books, yes. And I, I promise on everything. God told me, I feel like, God told me, Sean, everywhere you go, take him with you. Because I feel like if he was a, if he was a white man with that kind of skill set, he'd be a dog on Stephen King, James Patterson, you name yeah. one, yeah. but instead he in our community, and guess what? People walk by that man at Walmart without saying nothing, don't head nod, shake his hand, don't acknowledge his genius. We do our own genius is the worst. Yeah. So every time I get a chance to speak somewhere, if I get 20 minutes, I'm going to get 10 minutes and get him 10 minutes. Right. Well, uh, uh, for, my, for my boys uh, and over book signing, you are for, my, tonight. for my boys and over book signing, my biggest book sign I ever had in my life. Mm hmm you know what happened? Mm -hmm. That man in the parking lot at the trunk of my car, he sold more books than me at my book signing. In the parking lot of Barnes and Noble. Let, let, let me tell you something. But let I me... feel good about it. I'm not saying it in a bad way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because that's my effort to uphold our elders, uphold our geniuses, yes, uphold sir. our great ones around us. But, but your what... son, your son Lee, he a baby. <laughs> if you was in a different community, they would have all kinds of things just given to that boy to make sure he is, you know, carried along a certain trajectory right. or a certain end game. But in our community, no. I think this is the thing. This is the thing. I will say, and, and I'll say the fortunate thing that, that thankfully I get to do with my son is that I understand this, right? So I get to move him forward. And thankfully, we also have had experiences where, like, for instance, somebody called me this week from out of town to say, look, we want to talk to you about, you know, what we can do to support him. Nice. <clears throat> we have, because I don't want people to feel, and I'm real big on this. People know me, I'm real big on this. 
that that the black community does not offer help. I am a product of coming right out the hood with teachers, black and white, who have my back and are the real reason that I am where I am today. That's good. But as I have grown up more and more, I have noticed that it is some of the people who have the most access to resources who want to give me the least to help me move forward. That is problematic. Because we have a lot of people. I and, and it's so funny that you brought that up because I think about when I host my shows. When I host my annual shows, I usually have a guest that is also a performer or a poet that may not necessarily have a bigger a big platform. I've seen from there several of them have gone on to get opportunities that you know that have been in in, in other places outside of there. Uh, off the strength of them coming in and and us work, you know, uh, lighting up that platform and propelling them forward, that should be what we do. You know yeah, what I'm saying? It's our obligation. To be able to encourage exactly. If if you what what is it that you're doing? What is if you're not? If if your belief is that I encourage everybody except for someone who actually works in the same place that I do, you are not doing it for the right thing because the main people you will, should be able to influence will be people who also do what you do. Because there are too many people in this world who need to be inspired as well, right? So this should be a circle where we can also not be afraid to to to, to give an, an, an open pathway to somebody else that definitely needs it. You know what I'm saying? And, and we're, we're not promoting it at all. And I have to also express this to people as well because I've had to talk to artists. And I tell people all the time, nobody's implying that you give away everything you have for free. You have to have a limit. No. But when you feel compelled or connected with a person, do not yeah. ignore yeah. what you feel yeah. that is compelling you to invest in that person and to yeah. give them the opportunity to share their voice as well. We should be like I doing told you, I mentioned some of those uh, great leaders and doctors that you know had a hard time burying those guys, right? When I met Keith four or five years ago, it felt like this is my opportunity to make sure that don't happen to him. Right. Right. So whenever I had a, whenever I had a TV interview, I'm bringing them with me. Whenever I got a chance to go to a school and go and talk, I'm bringing them with me. I'm on a radio station, I'm bringing them with me. Yes, yeah. Every chance I get, we're gonna raise up our great ones because that's what the real work is about, man. Yep. Let you know what we gonna you. do? We gonna wait till that man die. All of a sudden, boy, look at his books he wrote. Look how great it was. He wrote all these different genres. Look at Octavia Octavia Butler. No, 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 no. Look at James Baldwin. James Baldwin. I've been reading James, James Baldwin. Baldwin since high school. And here we are in the past five years. Oh, People think Baldwin is the best thing since sliced bread. Like it just and came like, out. The interview with Nikki Giovanni, you guys are just seeing that. I saw that when I was in high school. We wait till now. This man, first of all, is a problem that he is talking about an issue 50 years ago that we are still fighting today. That's problem number one. Problem number two is that we should not be 50 years down the road and we are just now celebrating how profound and intellectual this man was and how he was walking into rooms with people who didn't even look like us at a time when the civil rights movement was at its strongest and coming down off a hiding point because they had finally been able to achieve some things. We should not still be just be looking at this man now and looking at how amazing he was. He's been amazing, right? Yeah. But it's what yeah. it is. It's what happens all the time. And that's why on my platform, I interview, I mean, anybody as far as authors go, but independent authors especially, I want them to have their chance to raise up their work and let my, you know, 5,000 whatever followers, whoever going to see it, let them get the opportunity to put their eyes on this work because you never know who on these platforms could be the next Baldwin, the next Octavia Butler, whoever. Mm -hmm. They're amongst us. Mm -hmm. They're walking around us every day. Mm -hmm. But our eyes closed to that. We, don't, we, don't, we only see the big name. The I'm big trying, publishers. I'm, the I'm Oprah, not, Winfrey, right. Oprah Winfrey pick of, the, pick of the week. You know, the the, the whoever so-and-so acknowledging, the New York Times acknowledging this person. We're yeah. missing so many people right here. Yes. Yes. Listen, I call yeah. it being hood rich. I call it being hood rich. I might not get New York Times bestseller, but in the hood... Well, and, and what, well, and, and to bring me around to an important thing as well, which is called the quality of meaningful writing. We are in a realm now where just because you can write it does not mean you are writing in a manner that is you can ensure is long lasting, uplifting to your people and meaningful. 
I don't care what genre it is. Yeah. What is your purpose behind writing it? Because I find that even our girl who writes erotica can be a lifesaver for marriages. You understand what I'm saying? Right, There's right, some woman right. that, that got her mojo back behind reading a good black book by a black erotica writer. So she got, she what got is it that you are doing and not being controlled by the fact that I can write something that brings in the dollars, right? Because what made Sister Soldier appeal was not just that she wrote a hood novel because there were plenty of quote unquote hood novels out there, sorry, but she I'm wrote sorry. it from a perspective that people could connect with and that meant something to people all across this country who needed uh, some relatability. And so when we are putting that pen to the paper as well, for what cause are we doing? For what mission are we doing it, right? Because if we're just working to throw something out there, because it doesn't matter whether it sticks, as mm. long as it bounces around and puts it in my pocket. Are you doing it for likes or for a legacy? Uh, Big one. You doing it for likes or a legacy? Somebody, somebody, put please. I know we got tons of people. Somebody will drop it in the comments. These are you people. Doing it for likes or legacy? Oh, I my told you, see, some of the things coming to, to the living room, all these backdoor conversations. These people are treating writing books like like it's a baby shower. I'm gonna be an author. I'm gonna have a. Uh, I'm gonna have a. I shouldn't have said that. I said too much again. Am I doing too much again? <laughs> I'm gonna have a book signing, and we're gonna have a little meet and greet area with the little six foot poster, and we're gonna sit here and sign. And then whenever that whenever that day over with, you never post your book again on your own page. But guess what? But I forget you. I forget you wrote a book. Let me tell you something, Sean. Let me tell you something. I've had this conversation multiple times and I've, I've had to tell people, you know, I do a consultations and people say, you know, I want to want to talk. Can you talk to me about writing? We'll sit down and we'll start talking and they'll say, well, you know, how is it that you get seven books written? And I'll sit down and explain the process. And what do you do after that? I said, oh, the work is just beginning after you do the, the book. Bro, reading. bro, you, bro. You know, the, the work is just beginning. Hey, President Noor, how are you? The work is just beginning after the book release. That's when you find out about the book signings. That's when you find out about the festivals that are happening. That's whenever you start reaching out to people to ensure your work is circulating. And that's when you start to get the criticisms that make you go back to the drawing board and assess whether you need to redo some things, keep it moving forward, or what you must do to go to that next level. Yeah. So what you say is 100% true because yeah. it has become... The idea that, uh, and one component, whenever I talk to to uh, clients, one component of this always reasons you should write a book versus reasons you should not write a book. And I tell people all the time, I don't want you to be a person who writes a book and then lets it sit on the shelf to collect dust. If you take the time to invest your emotions, your skill, your abilities, and your money into moving this project forward, I want you to see it through to the end as much as you can. Yeah. I I want that for you. Yeah. And, and we, we didn't mention in our, in our intro, we didn't say this part. Both of us have publishing companies. Both of us are publishing other people's work. So what that means is a lot of folks come to us and our DMs and everything else want to go to Starbucks and have means about writing a project. <laughs> Not go to Starbucks. <laughs> I, I said I said too much again. I said it again. <laughs> I'm on a roll tonight. Yeah. I'm just giving the real. Sure. I just give it. A, I just give it a real, man. No, no, no. Uh, can I? Can I pick your brain? Yeah, for yeah, a yeah, 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 yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> you silly. Look, there's a meme that says, "Yeah, you can pick my brain, but you can also pick a payment method too." It's so funny yeah. that you said, "Like it, it's true, mm -hmm. it's true." We get a lot of, lot of yeah, yeah. Mm. But, so they they, they 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 come with their manuscript and everything, and like you just saying, as I'm looking over what they're doing or what they what they want to do. I'm always thinking about how are you going to market this? How are you going to market this? Right. Mm -hmm. What is your method? You think in your mind before it even happens? Because like when I'm writing, I'm thinking about marketing the whole time. As I'm writing something, I know my business partner comes with the images. He gonna put a certain picture to go alongside with this on the page. It's gonna look good. When I'm writing this certain thing, I'm going to the schools with this. When I'm writing this, I'm going to the churches with that. Right. So what are you going with this? What you doing with all of this? Right. What are you doing? And most times they're not thinking about anything past this writing. The right. easiest part is writing. It is. It is. It That's is. What I feel. The easiest point is the writing. Right. It's an emotional experience, right? It is. 
because I've had several people where they get the writing done and then they bring it to me and I say, well, we have a little bit of work we need to do. And I've had some go. And I've had very few stay. So the writing component is easy because a lot of times it's driven from an emotional standpoint. You're excited about it. You you believe that this is the book that can take you to the top. You know, you you think that this idea is so grand, which all of that could very be true, very well be true. But understand that beside that passion, that belief and that motivation is this thing called work. You don't work, you don't eat, you don't grind, you don't shine, you don't shine. right? Come on, man. That's classic. That's Mike, classic right there. Mike Jones said it. That's like classic. look, Shakespeare said it. Who else hey. do you think you hear from? Like, 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 like how many no's can you take? How many school with your book? And the principal like, nah, we're not going to use that. Nah, we're not doing that. How many times you go to a radio DJ, man, let me come on your show and talk about my book. Nah, we're not doing that. No, how many no's can you take? I know, how many, no, I know how many no's I had. I had We've had I know how many no's. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I know how, how many, many no's I had. How many can you submit to that will reject you? How many applications can you fill out that will tell you no? How many times can you call a radio station that will say, nope, you're absolutely right? See, we're being transparent tonight. I'm going all the way. I feel, it's Friday, and I feel pretty good tonight. How about taking your money and buying hundreds of books? You paying your fee for a table at an event. I don't say you got all your You got all your tablecloths. You got all your you got all your meat and grease stuff, your little pamphlets, everything. You got suited and booted. It don't sell nothing. Because the whole the whole crowd want to buy popcorn candy across the across, popcorn balls. Across the way. They want that. They want they want t-shirts. They want no damn books. What you know about what you know about that? Let me tell you what you know. Let me tell you something. I swear it's not a lie. I swear it's not a lie. Or everybody is going to buy the person that has clothes. Or everybody's going to the person that has like anything but books because they don't read books anyway. You, I promise you. And and I am glad. And this is what people have to understand. I am thankful that I'm in a position now where I receive a lot more invitations than applications. You understand what I'm saying? But how many years did we have to put in to get to the point where we receive more invitations than applications? That took a long time. Man. This year, I'm celebrating the 10th year since the release of my first book, which was Tear Stained Dresses. This is the 10th year since the release of my first. It has been within the past three or four years that I have started to exceed invitations versus applications. It takes it, it takes some work. So look, look, you made me think about a story, okay? And I, I hope y'all don't mind me sharing this because <clears throat> it's yours. Go with it. One time, and Miss Nikki, thank you so much. I appreciate that. She said, I love that your gift is making room for him and you. It is far more than I expected. I'm gonna I'm tell y'all a spiritual story about that one day because I'll probably start crying, so I won't do that to you tonight. But let me tell you guys about this. Back when I was living in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Um, no, no, no. When I was still, I, I take that back. I was still living. I was living here in Monroe because I wrote my first book here in Monroe. So I wrote my um, first book when I was living up here. And okay, so we have a couple of questions in here too, and we'll get down to there. Oh, we got questions. Um, I, lo I love we'll questions. Get down to those too. So I had gone down to what happened was I had gone down to Baton Rouge to do a book festival out at Jones Creek Library. From there, I had been invited to a library out in Beaumont, Texas. So at this time, I still had my Altima, baby. You couldn't tell me anything. I was still driving like a speed demon, too. So I went to Baton Rouge, and the next morning I got up to try to head down to Beaumont, Texas. There was a storm that I had seen on the news, but I was like, I have to make it to Beaumont. I was excited to get the opportunity. I got on the highway, y'all, and when we say this storm was some serious, we're talking about rain coming down, wind blowing. Okay, if you don't, if you, you already know, we have had hurricanes here in southeast Louisiana, okay? So this was in the fall around hurricane season. So understand how it goes down when we say it starts raining in south Louisiana. It's no joke, okay? So I look up on the interstate across the way of a field, and what do I see, Jonathan? What, what do you think is in the field? A tornado? You already know it's a tornado. <laughs> tornado. Tornado. I am freaking out. It's raining so hard I cannot see. So I can't pull over because I'm like, how fast is this tornado moving? So I got to stay on the interstate 
trying to get to Texas. At this point, I'm just outside Lafayette, okay? So I keep going to Texas, you guys, and it's raining so hard that once I got to Lake Charles, I did pull over for a minute because I was nervous about crossing the bridge. I sat on the side of the road for about 20 minutes, called the library, told them I was running late because of the storm. They said, we understand it's raining here, too. When it finally eased up, I crossed over the bridge. And I One second. Going. Keep it going. One second. Keep going. Keep going. I start rolling toward Beaumont. Once I get over the bridge, I pull up to the library in Beaumont. I'm excited. We've been talking about this for a long time. Conversations have been going on and on. I'm thinking it's about to go down in Beaumont. I get in the library in Beaumont. I walk in. There are two little old white women and my brother. That's it. <laughs> After I literally drove through a tornado and a storm to get there. Two little old white women and my brother. My other brother, because at this point, both of my brothers were living in Beaumont. My other brother was trying to get off work and get there. So I started giving my presentation. I have pictures of this too. I have to find it. I started giving my presentation and I talk about the book. At this point, I had just written tear stained dresses time so i give this presentation and i'll speak my heart out because i really wanted to cry when i first got there but i said you know what god i'm here so since i'm here to do it i'm gonna do this the right way and let me tell you something after i finished speaking the old little white lady came over to me yep. and she said to me i am so glad i came here tonight to hear you speak she said, as old as as, as as old as I am or something about her age, she said, every single thing that you said resonated with me as a woman. She said, and I heard you talk about teaching. And when you talked about teaching, you got, you got really passionate. And your students are very lucky to have you. But I want to tell you, you're going a lot of places and you're going to do a lot of things. And standing right there in front of that woman, I broke down in tears. And I'm sharing that story to say this. It's, it's so funny when I listen to Sean talk about, are you ready to show up to events when you won't get, when you won't make a dime and you pay registration and you bought books, you have on your best outfits, you got your good, your good uh, selling voice going and you are not the hot ticket of the night. You're not the hot item they want. Are you ready to show up to an event where you've driven through a storm, rearrange everything on your schedule and you show up to a room of three people and two of them don't even look like the audience you think you're writing for. And you still get up there and do what you have to do anyway. Yeah. And eventually realize that what you came to get to that night was probably not even book sales. See, understand that this journey does not just come with making money. You have to be molded before you can even get to that point. You've got to be taught some things. You've got to be shown some things. You have to go on wisdom. There are yes. whole bunch of lessons you're going to have to learn before you get to the point of thinking you're even capable of making the financial income from this journey. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, and you know what? We're not, we not, we not, we not saying these things to discourage anybody from writing. No. We love writers, of course. But what we do want to do, well, what I want to do, I love taking that veil off. Yeah. I love taking them rose-colored glasses off to get down to the real actual right. world because, you know, what you just described, that story you just said, and my story I said, and back and forth, right? It reminded me of the up-and-coming comedians, Kevin Hart, who all of a sudden just be on the Madison Square Garden, oh, uh, no. uh, oh, Richard no. Pryor, Martin yeah. Lawrence. You, you, you pick yeah. one, those guys go on what they call the chitlin' circuit. Mm -hmm. and you and all red these little hole in the walls, all these, mm -hmm. all these little, all these little hole in the walls, speak easies, doing your gig. Mm -hmm. By the mm -hmm. time you see Kevin Hart on the HBO special. He's done that joke a thousand times across the country. Let me see. Might have got booed, might have had something thrown at him, might have had a fight that night. Like by I the time know. you see them get to the grand stage, they done did this. And the that's what we're doing. I saw Kevin Hart was on BET and nobody in the audience was laughing. Every other artist had been up. He got up, nobody was laughing. The first time I think that was BET. I saw him on more than one stage and he was not the 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 like so would you say it's very true about what it takes to get from that place to the place where you are now. Like, and realize it. And he talked about, I think it was like eight years before something actually happened for him. 
Oh. And, and so what we're saying is that if you really believe this is the call and understand, for some people, you're very fortunate. You'll put out that first book and somebody will call you and say, hey, we're going to give you a contract. But for a lot of people who enter this realm, the journey is different. What you have to do to get there is much different. Yes. And, you know, in the acting world, they call it getting your chops. You're getting your chops. Yeah, 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 yeah. You, yeah. you, 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 you are getting battle tested. Yeah. Because what you think you want versus what the reality is, is two different things. And we're going to find out how bad you really want it. <laughs> I told you once again, I told you once again, when I did my first book, I wanted to be a writer. That's what I thought. I didn't think I had to go and get all these apps to be a photographer to get the best picture of my book yeah, to post yeah, for, yeah, for promo. Yeah, I got to go yeah. and get tripods. I got to go and get other kind of equipment for better. I, I wasn't thinking about that when I was writing my first book. Mm -hmm. yes. Now I'm doing, doing yes. audio books. Told you this. Yes. I'm doing audio books. Now I got to be a DJ and a, yes. and a producer. I got to go get microphones. I got to go get software on the laptop. I got to go and learn all these keys. Yep. I didn't think about that when I wanted to be a writer. Yeah. I got to be all these things. Yeah. Because we don't have a machine. Yes. We are the machine. Yes. When you call yes. my phone to place an order, that's me. Yes. Whenever something wrong with your order, that's me. <laughs> when it's time to get shipped, that's me. When it's time to sign it, that's me. <laughs> when I'm the featured speaker who's setting the room up, that's me. Who breaking it down when you leave? Who's staying behind to break the room down? This guy. So, I mean, you are really like a master P, the old school 50 cent. You are army of one. And so whenever I became an author, I had that mindset coming into it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm about to be out the trunk, Master P, 1994. Like, let's get it. Uh, and not many, <laughs> not many indie authors got that mindset. Yeah. By any means necessary. Any By means. any means necessary. Any means. By any means necessary. Yes. By any I've, means necessary. I've done radio interviews I didn't want to do. Right. But it's an opportunity. Mm -hmm. I've done certain presentations I didn't want to do. But it was opportunity. You can't really be picking and choosing in the beginning. But now you and I, we did our thing for a while, so you know we kind of can sort of. Uh, yeah, you know, it got it got to be right now. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. that's for real. It's so real. You talking? I wanted to ask you because I admire you a whole lot. I wanted to ask you a question, some some author questions, right? Okay, and I have so. You have, you have a ton of skill sets. That's obvious. You, you're very gifted, right? So what made you want to be an author above anything else? You and I just spent 20 minutes discussing some of the woes of being an author. What made you want to be an author versus anything else with your skill set? So I, I will say this. Um, initially, when I was growing up, for many years as a kid, I was on an attorney kit. And only an attorney kit for a long time. And then I was on uh, the therapist kit. And, and I had a whole blueprint. I was like, I'm going to open, y'all might laugh, but I was like, I'm going to open a, a, a wellness center. And my mom can validate this. Where I do hair, we have hairdressers and beauticians on a spa on one side. And we have therapy and counseling on the other. And you'll be able to come there for a long term. And we basically teach beauty from the inside out. Had a whole blue, blue plan for it. Uh, and, and actually, for many years, stuck with that. But when I was in 10th grade, um, I, and the reason that I felt driven to that is because I lived in a house where my mother suffered with depression for a very, very long time. And I really wanted to um, be able to like help other families out. And I knew I was dealing with depression as well. So that was my goal. I'm like, I want to help women who go through this kind of stuff. Um, when I was in 10th grade, my 4-H agent asked me to enter a public speaking contest. And I had done a little writing then. I had done a little contest at school and things like that. And I liked it. I loved Dr. Angelo. I liked poetry. But I didn't know that that was going to be my thing. And so um, she asked me to enter the public speaking contest. And I'm like, I don't know what to do. And she was like, you know what to do. Just enter it. And see, we were in 4-H. So it wasn't like I could bring home a chicken you know, because they had the, you could raise the cow when you go to short course during the summer. So I couldn't do anything agriculture. So she told me to do the public speaking contest. I went to the public speaking contest that summer and it was my first time competing. 
and I actually met a man, and I tell people, I don't know where this man is. I don't remember his name, but I'll never forget he was a black news reporter, and he was from Monroe, where I live now. And after I presented, he came over to me, and he told me that I was gifted, and I didn't need to stop speaking. In addition to that, it was just the energy I felt after I spoke for the first time. Um, I could not explain how I felt such a release of the burdens I had been dealing with. Um, I felt hopeful. Um, and a lot of people were coming up to me saying how inspired they were, like other kids from the class. And I was like, I like doing this. I had already been writing at home because I was using my writing privately to help me like really deal with the trauma and the things that we were going through, but it was just a private thing. And so from there, I wanted to do more public speaking contests. I tell people all the time, everybody else was like cheering in the band. I started doing public speaking. And so, and so once I started doing it, the more I did it, the more I loved it. So by the time I got to my senior year, I had done competitions all over the state. I had developed a name for it. I was competing for the church. I was speaking in my community. I was collecting more poetry. And so I knew I always wanted to write. Um, and I did think, I didn't know exactly where I would end up because I heard everything from, you know, they would call me little Oprah. I was with a performance troupe. So I knew it was going somewhere. And when I got to college, I actually still started off in psychology because people made me feel like it was the safe route. It was the safe thing to do. I did not like the classes I took. I was just like, I'm sorry, I'm so bored. I'm not, I don't like it. And I changed my major to English. And when I changed it to English, I, I enjoyed it. And I, I don't know, somehow the word got out even on campus that I was like a really good writer and people would try to get me to help them. But I was working and going to school. And I was like, I'm not the one to help you all. And I remember I even did a poetry contest at LSU two years and I ended up winning. And those were like the only two times I ever spoke at the university level. And I won. And I think one year I was first place, other year I was second or something like that. So long story short, I knew I wanted to write a book, but I just didn't know really how it would happen. And I entered teaching as well because I really felt like, once again, that was my safe haven. But even as, as a teacher, I just never could get rid of my desire to speak on a bigger platform, to get back on the stage. I remember the day that changed my life and I realized that I really had the gift to do it in a much bigger era, area was when I spoke for the Beta Club State Convention my senior year. And I went into that room, which was an arena, and there were literally thousands of kids in there. And I had won first place in the state. And the feeling of peace that came over me being on that stage made me feel like I was at home. And every time that I get on a stage to talk to people, the bigger the stage, the more at home I feel. Every time That's I weak. write um, and I think about what has been done for my people through storytelling, the legacy yeah. that we leave, the, the way that we help our people evolve and grow, the way that we change and impact lives, the way that we celebrate our culture, how much um, we need to continue to write down what our grandparents and parents have been through, the digging that is there in those words. I'm like, God, I want to leave an imprint on the world. I'm getting emotional. <laughs> that is so profound that we continue to help our people move forward and as i continue to grow and i think about what my grandmother has been through and what my grandparents went through and even what i went through as a child and as i read through history books and learn about what our people have been through in this country if we did not have written documentation of it how could we ever know our people's stories Man. so i really knew that god called me to do something greater and to tell stories and to connect with people and to, you know, when you mix what you know is a supernatural gift with what you have studied intently, you know, people always say, Jamie, how is it that you move audiences so much? And it's always humbling to me because the calling I have is bigger than me as an individual. But the passion I have is because I wake up every day with the hope that I can leave an imprint on society just as important as what people like Maya Angelou, Toni Morrison, Philly, Phyllis Wheatley, and everybody else has done for us through storytelling. And right. so there's no greater calling that there is for me. It frees me. Writing frees me. Speaking frees me. Um, and being able to start training my son, who is seven years old and has already started standing on stages, it is yes, far is. more 
than I imagined. It, it used to be emotional for me when I would train my students to be poets. It used to be emotional for me to listen to them write. I would cry in my classroom with my kids to hear them write masterpieces. But to look at the child that is my product yes. and see him coming up and saying, Mama, I want to do what you do. Oh. It just amplifies how important it is for us to make sure we are communicating these stories. The power of the tongue Man. in changing the world is so much people, more serious than we realize. People take that lightly, right? Because people, for some reason, think that whatever you are as a parent, like it's just osmosis to your kids. Yeah. It's a ridiculous thought because just because your daddy was a doctor or a dentist don't mean you all of a sudden be having a scalp when you want to get it. Or your daddy was a mechanic, so now you just all it's not automatic like that. Mm -hmm. A lot of us are speakers and writers and always reading and studying. My kids can care less about books. <laughs> that's 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 a showing thing. Yeah, that's yep. not what they want to yep. do. So for your yep. for your son to gravitate to what mama doing the way he does, whenever I see your videos you post all the time, I'm always in my heart smiling, looking at that young man like wow. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. Wow. You know what? And this is wow. the ironic irony about it. I never imagined um him having because I always tell people, you know, my child had no obligation to do what I want to do. You you be a kid, you do what you want to do. Yeah. You have no obligation to do what mama does. You do you. He was two years old the first time he started talking to me about what I do. I have a video of him grabbing the mic. I am gonna share that video. He was two years old the first time he communicated that to me, and I took it as a joke. I'm like, come on, whatever. And he never stopped saying it to me. He was three and a half by the first time I started training him with his first poem and thinking that he was probably serious. And I think he was around four with the first time he hit the stage on his own. And I'll never forget the night when we did a poem together. Uh, he did Lights of Use and I did All American Girl. And I looked over at my child and realized he was dead serious on that stage. And this is the thing I try to tell people. My mission is not to try to make my, if he comes to me tomorrow and says, I, I don't want to do this, that's fine. You, my goal is to teach him to be honorable, have morals, and to be a respectful and kind person and leave an impact on the world. If he wants to be the garbage man, I want him to be like these young men who have come to my house time and time again in the morning when I was packing up a baby and going to a classroom as a single parent and came to my driveway and said, look, don't, don't worry about that, ma'am. We'll get your trash and bring it out to the corner in the mornings. If you forget, don't stress about that. I want him to be that kind of young man that's out there doing that kind of work, no matter what you do. Yeah. yeah. It, it, and, and that's the right that our kids have. If God has called him to do something different, then I am receptive of that and truly honored and amazed. Yes. But our kids, we, we want them just to be moral people. That's all we want for them. We And that makes our heart proud. Cause it's yeah. hard to do that. Man, that, that ain't that ain't easy. Look, that ain't it, easy. It's hard let, me, to make let, me, <laughs> let me tell you something. About, let me tell you something I heard recently. Right, the rapper, the RZA from the Wu Tang Clan, he was telling a story in an interview about Nas. Right, he's a little bit older. He said he met Nas whenever Nas was fourteen years old. He said in his estimation, in his guesstimation, it took about ten years to be a master rapper. A master elite level MC. He said Nas is already master level at 14 years old. He said whenever he met Nas, Nas is already like a Bobby Fisher in chess. He was already a, a, a child prodigy, if you will. So if your son do what he doing at seven years old, if he, if he chooses that path, by the time your son 14, 15 years old, bruh, bruh, no, I'm so I have a question for you. I have oh, a question. Okay. Cool. Okay. 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 I watched your um one of the videos you had um with the AOC. As a matter of fact, the one I was watching for a second time when you came wow. out, <laughs> and um I I did not know. I I think you had told me maybe you were in the Navy before, but I didn't know. And I heard you saying that that was not an experience you enjoyed. No. Um, but no. I believe that. It was an important experience when we hear yeah. about the military and things like that. I don't think people know, and I and I hope people go go. Please go follow Sean on Instagram. We're gonna put links and everything in the comments. You have so much discipline, 
so much discipline. We're talking about rigorous reading. We're talking about intensive studying. We're talking about setting an action plan and making it happen. Like the discipline is so strong. And what I wanted to ask you was, despite the fact that you do not feel the Navy was the place where you belong, because I feel like this is a statement people need to understand, because we often feel that we're in places where we don't belong. But I feel that every spot we hit has something we can take. How do yeah. you feel yeah. that the neighbor, Navy influenced the drive and motivation that you possess now as a writer and speaker? Man, that's one of the most difficult questions in the world, friend. Right. <laughs> so for those that don't know, my books are self-help books. They're motivational. They're inspirational. Right. So when I do a, a, a big presentation, I'm doing my thing, and then we go to the Q&A section, and the person asks me, like, well, Sean, like, how do you get motivation? Or when did you become motivated? Questions like that. It's difficult because from the time I could remember in consciousness, I was always this laser-driven person. It just wasn't writing, and it wasn't speaking. But my mom knows since two, three years old, it was martial arts. Okay. All my friends playing basketball and football, all the popular sports, I want to do martial arts. I'm watching Bruce Lee. I'm watching uh, 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 John claude Van Damme, Steven Seagal, you know, all the 1980s classics. I was on that track. And then like eight years old, nine years old, I don't know how, I saw basketball. And his light bulb went off like, and then from eight years old until my adulthood, it was like singular focus, like just basketball. And, you know, all the training and the practice and watching film. And, of course, for anybody that's watching that's young, we didn't have YouTube. We didn't have yeah, TikTok. Yeah. <laughs> I had to literally get an NBA, an NBA VHS tape, yeah. <laughs> press play, watch Michael Jordan do this thing. Press pause, run outside to my to my my parking lot court and try to mimic what I just saw and then come back and check it again. Like, like real rigorous, and I'm an only child, right? So I didn't have any siblings. So my grandfather bought me one of those street light kind of things to go inside the house. So I'm all night by myself as a kid, shooting Joe side, shooting Joe side, shooting by myself, all night dribbling up and down the street by myself for years. So whenever I finally came to the military, I would say that I was already a super disciplined person mm -hmm, mm -hmm. before I even got to the military. So to answer your direct question, I don't think the military necessarily gave me anything. Because what you the, the misconception from TV and everything is <laughs> you go to boot camp in the military, you just program forever. But when you graduate boot camp, the military is like a regular everyday job. You go to your job, you do your work. Mm -hmm. And you, you get off at four, five o'clock, and guess what? You want to smoke and drink and eat crazy food all night, you can. Right, right. Or, or like every, every day, day, like, if you're an athlete and you're going to the gym and you're running and working out and you're training and you whatever, you that too. Mm -hmm. So I was in that category. Every day right. we get off, right. I'm playing basketball five, six days a week. I'm running on my own. I'm training on my own. Like, that's the kind of person I am. So whenever I left the military mm -hmm. and I came back home, I started reading these books, and that was a wrap. See, I have a, I have a very, I have a very addictive personality, and I know that. So I thank God that everything He put in my hands were positive things, and it wasn't drugs, it wasn't alcohol, it wasn't some of the vices in the world. Because the way I am, as you can probably tell my energy, whatever I do, I do it all the way. Go, go hard. Yeah. So if I if I was smoking, you know, I was smoking me. Yeah. If I was drinking. I'm drinking yeah. the most. So I'm glad that an OG That's put not when you found your extreme personality. Yes. Right. So yes. I'm glad that I'm glad that an OG on the ship. Yes. I was 18, 19 years old. I wasn't doing good academically my whole life. That's not my story. Mm -hmm. I wasn't reading as a little boy. That's mm -hmm. not my story. Mm -hmm. I was a grown man in the military and the OG said, Man, you look bored. Check out this book. Check this out. Mm -hmm. And I will never forget reading uh, uh, a day late in a dollar short. By myself, it's not for a school assignment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nobody's making me Come do it. The power and the reading. feeling I got yes. in my heart when I closed the last page of yes. a book by myself. Yes, yes. That was like climbing Mount Everest. Like, 
Yes. As a young black man, I saw myself finish a book front to back. Yes. And then you started feed me more books. Yourself. Feed me before more yourself. books. And before you yes. know it, instead of that man giving me books, I started taking my own money and buying my own books. Now I'm buying the Eric Jerome Dickey. I'm buying the Omar Tyree. I'm buying the Sister Soldier. I'm buying Nikki Turner, Carl Weber. I mean, the classic urban fiction. Mm-hmm. Donna Goins, Iceberg Slim. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Then over time, I graduate to read Malcolm X. Mm-hmm. After I read Malcolm X, that, that was, was it. it. That's it. That was it. That rearrange your whole DNA structure on a on a, on a molecular yeah. level yeah. after yeah. you read Malcolm yeah. X. Yeah. yeah, yeah, So I mean, I hope I answered your question, but then that rundown I, of how I am as a person, because you actually bring into into uh, into view an important point where you talk about the fact that well, anytime you found something that you have been interested in, you've had a, a, a sense of excellence. With yes. for all out. and I think all that, <laughs> like out. when I say that's a that's an important all point, yeah. it's such an important point because we have lost so much drive toward excellence. We have become to the point where it's just okay. I remember as a teacher being so frustrated when my students would ask the question, would ask the questions, "What well, did I pass?" And I said, "Well, don't you want to be great? Don't you want greatness? Don't you want excellence?" Right? And so what you said is so important. You were like, "The military may have shaped that," and I met somebody in the military that helped point in a path that changed my life. Yes. But before then, yes. and, and honestly, because being in a place where you're not necessarily happy and don't feel that's your calling. You can definitely get caught up into negative things that you feel are coping mechanisms, but instead your life was revolutionized by a person that didn't hand you a drink instead of that they handed you the book. And it, let's be let me, real, in the military, that can easily happen. Like, yes. you know, you let, know. Me, let me let me give a little sprinkle for the family. Like I was 18, 19, you know, young man from Franklin, Louisiana, small town, and now I'm thrust across the world, literally. Yeah. I had never dealt with racism at a high level yeah. where I'm from. Because because yeah. most cities are naturally segregated. Not not by law, but just naturally. I hang out in these places. I play ball in these places. I'm not even seeing them over there. Mm-hmm. But now I'm in the military where these guys are higher ups. They're superior, if you will. But they got these mentalities. Mm-hmm. And as an 18-year-old young man, I didn't know what to do with that energy yes. in a positive way. Yes. So I was lashing out. I was combative. I was getting in trouble. I was insubordinate. It was just a lot of things that are highly frowned upon yes. <laughs> in the United States <laughs> military. And it wasn't it wasn't for me. Yes. You know? Yes. But the books was a great it was, it was it was a great escape because see, I talk about this. Remember the old school books? The pilot was like this big. Mm-hmm. It was like see? Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. So, when I'm, when, I, when I'm in uniform, I can slip Eric Jerome Dickey in my pocket. Nice. I can slip I can slip Megan my coffee right here. I can slip they lay yeah. down and start. So yeah. I'm, I'm supposed to be up. Um, but on the slick, I can sneak in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I always tell people I read like I'm in jail. Yeah. I, I, I read. I read with the energy yeah. and a fervor. Like a yeah. person in jail. That's how I read. Like it's all you have. Like it's all you have. Like it's yes. all you have. Like yeah. I'm devouring. I'm devouring this. Yes. I'm killing yes. this. Yes. And it's funny, at my job, and I'm sitting there reading, right? And people walking by, they always ask, "Oh, you in school?" <laughs> Jackie, so, they always think you got me. That, yes, that's how much not, we have lost the passion for reading. Yes. They're not. They're, they're not just seeing. Young black guys sitting there reading for no reason. That's it. That's this, it. This, this, this gotta be for something. Yeah, yeah. Or they well, see me paper. sitting there. They see me sitting there writing. Oh, what was what, what, that for? You have a paper, right? Right. Mm-hmm. No, I'm not in school. I'm the professor. Come on. They be like, they, come, they be like come, come on, Professor Polidor. Literally, <laughs> literally, the professor. Like I'm, literally, I'm, I'm the professor. I'm not in school. So, but this is what people fail to realize because we have a lot of people that are in professor and leadership positions who don't do any more other than what they're required. So how is it that you can continue to be, have a drive towards excellence and grow and stay ahead of the pack in the game if you don't pay, uh, take effort to feed yourself mentally? Yes. You how to, is you it? Have to, you have to. Look, 
And, and I'm a, I say this in a non-competitive spirit. I tell people all the time. I recently started telling people, I say, I have a poem I wrote called, I want to be the best who's ever done it. I said, and this does not negate anybody else, but it is a challenge to myself to ensure I stand on top of my responsibility to be the best writer possible. I want to be the best who's ever done it. Because when you talk about always living on a hundred, whenever you show up to do something, I want I want to be the one that came in the room and had a hundred percent every single time. It has nothing to do with anybody else but what I expect of myself. Yes. It's yes. a certain it's, it's a it's an internal standard, right? Yes. yes. Some yes. people some people have a thing on the inside of them. Once again, some guys I know from the from the, from the kind of the, the, the prison system, right? Mm -hmm. Every day, 100 push-ups. You got to do it. Mm -hmm. At some point in the day, some people might go and walk a mile or two. Some people do certain other habits. I do not close my eyes without reading something. I love it. If I'm dead, if I'm real, real, yes, even if, if it's I'm real, I have done something to read. Yes, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm real sick and I'm medicated, I'm down bad, I'm in there with the Kindle. That's I'm gonna get my, right. I'm gonna get my two lines in, well, like, that's okay, the I best did time. exactly. That's the best time because I know I'm not gonna do anything else that day. Get my book out and cover as much as I can. Let yes. me tell you this I can't remember when I started doing that. So, over the course of years doing that, right, you end up reading a lot, right. It's over years, two pages a day, five pages, two sentences. Same mm -hmm. thing with the writing. Mm -hmm. Look, my, my guy told you about Keith Nicholson, the OG. Right. This man told me two weeks ago, he has written for 4,579 days straight. I'm going to say it again. He has written 4,579 something days consecutively. Right. Like, that means no matter what, my mama's sick, oh, I'm right. sick. The, the light got cut off last night. They had a storm last week. No matter what. Right. So the the challenge is, what is your personal thing going to be? Yes. Yes. To the viewership. You know what I'm saying? We, 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 we lost these words. Mastery. When the last time yes. somebody said, Jamie, I want to master this. I want to master Whoever says that? Yes. What, I, what happened to the apprenticeship? Yep. Oh, wait a minute. Because well, everybody, Jonathan, I say it all the time. Everybody wants to be the leader and the boss, but you do not want to be the apprentice. And you have to learn before you can lead. You it's it's ten thousand hours to master a craft. And folks want to debate that, right? I said, take the numbers out of the equation. If I do something more than you do it, who gonna be better? Who's gonna be better? Simple as that. Forget about the numbers. If I'm doing it more than you doing it. Who gonna be better? So when it comes to writing, I'm a dog. I mean, I inbox writers every day. I'm asking my friends for writing prompts. I'm asking my writer friends, man, look at what I wrote you last night. Me Critique. You, 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 I, I've said two things. I do this every day. But you'd be surprised how many self-proclaimed poets mm -hmm. don't write. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Until you feel you have huh? something ready to come out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, mm -hmm. now you want to write. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be like a muscle. Mm -hmm. You gonna work out sometimes? I want to go and compete. Okay. You can't. You you can't just work out when you feel like you got some belly fat. You got to work out in between. Or the, the... Let, me let, let, let me tell the family something y'all don't know. So about six seven years ago, I did a bodybuilding competition. Right? If you ever saw bodybuilding before, you on that stage in front of thousands of people. With some bikinis on. Huh? So for all the months of training leading up to that night, every meal you miss, every time you didn't go on the treadmill, every time you say, nah, I'm tired, I'm staying in the bed, I don't feel like it today, when you finally go on that stage that night, and you butt naked with them little bikinis on, you're going to regret. Take it down, take it down. All your lack of discipline, you're going to regret every time. Oh, I should have just Avoid that dog on honey bun that time, because it all comes out. Yeah, yeah. And the same thing with with the, with the writing. When it's time for the poetry slam, if I gotta follow you, oh my god! <laughs> if I gotta follow somebody like Miss Jamie right here, you know how much prep I'm doing? Oh man, so funny. I'm not following behind you just like this this willy nilly. You gotta come with it. 
I wanted us to answer Miss Nikki's question. She yeah, said, let's do it, please. So we can both talk on this. Did either yeah. of you ever lose your drive and focus while pursuing your passion? If so, how did you regain focus and momentum to push forward? Lady, lady first. So uh, I would say definitely. I've lost my, I, I would not say I've lost my drive, but I've lost my motivation. And, and I would say, this is why I say I've never lost my drive. Because my drive lives even whenever I don't feel my best. But there have definitely been times when I've lost my motivation. Um, I've taken hard L's, like losing, um, <laughs> like not getting selected for a magazine appearance, um, going a long mm -hmm. way and not getting anything published or just times when I'm like, I've been doing this for a long time and I'm tired. I don't feel well. I'm exhausted. Um, after I had my son and I was a single parent, well, I am a single parent. Uh, so personal issues that I feel overwhelmed me and um, just feeling like I didn't have a space to really have an audience that would want to be engaged with me anymore. So there have been multiple times over the course of the 10 years where I have definitely had moments where I was like, like, seriously, especially when I had my son, I was done. I wasn't, I was like, it was, that was it. Um, and I remember, and really just because it was more about what was going on the external with that than the internal, like I was taking in a lot of negativity. Um, and then in those other moments, it was just like, I'm working so hard and I'm having two careers and I'm just tired. But at the end of the day, man, I like every single time it's like I would get up and I just like it just I didn't choose the call. The call chose me. And God's impact in my life was so much stronger than my impact in my own. And then there will always be something where I'm going back to the pen because the pen is my coping mechanism. And I just wrote this piece. And then it's always like um, he's like, you know, you don't write these just for yourself. You know you don't write these just to put them under the bed or under the pillow. And every single time, eventually it comes down to when you get on the stage and you keep connecting with people and you keep sharing these pieces and you keep realizing that that this is what you're called to do and there's nothing else you could do. Like, I just got to the point where I, I just was like, this is bigger than me. So the thing for me now is, since you're allowed to get down, but the next day you get your butt up. You're allowed to have those moments, but you shake it off the next day. Um, and now it's not so much that I, I lose focus the same way or the motivation the same way, especially since um, I have spent more time um, on my pen recently than ever. Um, and so it, it just hits different. I have no doubt about who, what my identity is. I have no doubt about what my calling is. So there's nothing else that I can do except for what I was made to do. It is my lifeline. I can't be functional any other way in my life without my lifeline. So that's the thing for me. I realized that when I'm not speaking, when I'm not writing, when I'm not talking about writing, uh, when I'm not talking to somebody else about writing, I am not myself. So that, that's it. And, and I tell people that when you go through that, allow yourself time to be human. Because the yeah. human side of us is that we encounter, what did uh, Malcolm, what, 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 who is that said? We, we must, we will encounter defeat, but we must never be defeated. I like that. We must never be defeated. And that has been yeah. the thing that has made the biggest difference. And over the years, I've just had the chance to do this so often that I know that the calling is just so much bigger. Um, recent years have been just so amazing to me, but prior to getting to that point where God was willing to take me to places I had not experienced, I had to demonstrate that my, that my commitment was bigger than whether or not I felt good today, than whether or not I feel happy at this moment, mm. than whether or not, um, I made a bunch of book sales or not. And when I, when I demonstrated that I was committed that way, that's when I started to see things really turn around for me. Let me let me let me jump on the back of that. What you just said was powerful, my sister. There's a quote that says something like, "If you only go to the gym when you feel like going to the gym, you will never go to the gym." So what you just said, like, if you only write when you feel like writing, like, what is that going to be? Mm -hmm. How many books can you get done if you only write whenever that lightning bolt hit? Oh, I feel good like writing today, and you swaying back and forth. That go back to that discipline conversation, like. You got to cultivate that habit to where at this time of day, on these days of the weeks, this is when I write. 
I've been blessed and privileged to take part in the uh, the master class program, right? I would advise anybody that's watching this live, if you can, invest in yourself. Master class. Walter Mosley master class. James Patterson master class. Malcolm Gladwell. We can go on and on. Nikki, uh, uh, N.K. Jemison, Shonda Rhimes, Issa Rae, you name it. Mm -hmm. They all talk about their writing ritual, their writing routine. I love studying that because they all vary but they all have one. Mm -hmm. They all have one. Mm -hmm. Question B, what's going to be your routine? What fits you? What fits you? Is that what's going to be your ritual? Mm -hmm. It's to answer the question for myself. I would say I was blessed not to really have any laps in my drive or my mo momentum, my, my motivation, because mm -hmm. of, I use the momentum concept, right? Wow. I had these multiple irons in the fire. Mm -hmm. So whenever, let's just say, okay, the pandemic hit, right? So for right. almost two years or a year and a half, I'm not going to the school speaking to the kids. Right. I love doing that. So right. while I'm not speaking to the kids, I'm writing. I published four books on the pandemic. Because my main thing is what? Teaching, instructing, mm -hmm. making an impact. So mm -hmm. I can't do it on this stage. Mm -hmm. Now I'm writing. Now mm -hmm. I'm writing. When I can't write, now I'm going to do these all the interviews. Right. For the past three or four months, every Friday night clockwork, sometimes during the week, I have all the interviews lined up. So just having these multiple irons in the fire at all times, I never get stagnant and just shut down. Exactly. I'm always adding to the fire, adding to the fire, adding to the fire on a daily basis. You got to find out what that is. I'm going to leave you on the mic for just a second. I'm going to leave you on the mic to keep talking for okay. just a second. Cool. I'll keep running it. I'll keep running it. So something else that I did to keep myself going is I've cultivated a decent circle of fellow writer friends. So like on a daily basis, I'm contacting certain people about their writing projects, their writing process. We share work back and forth. We encourage each other. We critique each other. Or even if I'm not writing, I still get a little bit of a spark just seeing what they're doing. So as they're showing me their work, I feel like, man, I want to get in that too. I want to I want to do my thing as well. You know what I'm saying? So that's a few of my suggestions, right? Somebody said, the story is not about us. It's so much bigger. Yes, everyone has a story. I agree. How will we use it? Thank you all and keep sharing and pushing us to be better and do better. Yes, you're totally absolutely right. I do feel like every single individual in this world has a unique story. And some people say, well, nah, Sean, nobody want to hear my story. Nah, it's not that interesting. You never know what particular person out there need your exact story. Either your voice, your tone, your, your, your where you come across, your energy. You never know what the spot going to be to where they say, Jamie, you said something on that stage last night or something on that, on that book. And that spoke just to me. Whenever folks inbox me like that, when I'm sitting at 2 in the morning writing, I never know. Mm -hmm. This guy overseas is going to see this book. Mm -hmm. And they said, man, what you saying right here, that spoke just to me. Mm -hmm. I love when I get that kind of response. So I'll leave it at that. So we had another question that showed up as well before we get uh, any further. And we're at 751, you guys. And we set aside two hours. It's crazy to think that we're almost at two hours. Already. Yeah, we, 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 so, we didn't shot that thing. <laughs> the question that we have, again, is from Miss Nikki. And if you guys have any other questions, please go ahead and drop them. And we're going to try to knock them out. Um, she said, how do you all make and keep connections with like-minded people? I find myself wanting to keep my circle small, small, so I delete friends who are inactive or not interacting, and possibly, um, uh, possibly cutting off valuable connections. Okay, so this is actually a question I had in my laptop for Miss Jamie. We didn't get to it, but now we're getting to it right now, right? Right, right. Because because being a writer, back to being the author, what that's like in real life, being a writer could be a very lonely endeavor. Right. Being a writer is like a person that's mountain climbing on Mount Everest by themselves. There's no team around you. Like, it's you and your backpack and your little materials. you just going up there, hiking up Everest. Being a writer could be a very isolated thing. So I really advise going on social media, find writer groups, find writer clubs, mm -hmm. uh, depending on what city you're living in, find a, a writer's guild of some sort. A lot of cities have them. Um, and just me being who I am, a social, a social butterfly, 
When I see a different author on Instagram, I go and inbox them. And we start chopping it up, and now we sharing work back and forth. I see certain people on somebody else's uh, live, and they're, they're fellow writers. I go and friend them. And now, over the course of years, I've cultivated a community of, of, of this writer group to where we all celebrating victories together. They can understand my woes. They can understand when I'm up and down. Because guess what? My wife loved me to death. But if my book doesn't sell, she can't relate right. to that. She's not right. a writer. Right. Or if my book gets rejected from Amazon, and I got I to gotta submit it again because the cover not right. She can put about, you know, pat my back and rub my shoulder, but she don't get that. But Jamie do. Other writers on the, on the thing, they can understand what I like to get rejected. So you want to cultivate that group that understand you and they get you. But that takes you being active and cultivating that. Reaching out, inboxing, you know, things like that. It's my, it's my suggestion. So, and, and so this is my thing. Um, I will say that as I... As I continue to move up, and I'm want to tell Christy thank you on IG. I'm streaming through my phone as well. But I want to say this that as you continue to move up and you're calling and what you're doing, you may find that your social circle changes and it does get smaller because you're more focused. Um, and I mean, just life happens. But I will say this as well. Um, as far as you know, the modifications on social media, that is hard. I'm a person that also has a big social media community and I do have some people that are inactive. I've gone through that phase of having to remove accounts that are dead or things like that. But if there are people who whose insights you find to be valuable, sometimes it's just that they're not popping up because of the algorithm on social media. So maybe you want to initiate that conversation with them to kind of help get them back into your algorithm. Um, maybe even keep in contact with them infrequently if there are people that you think you share valuable insight and connection with. Sometimes people just don't see it. Or there are some people who just don't comment as well. There are a lot of people, you know, that's the, the, the craziest thing for me is you will be amazed how many people I have who actually watch my page but say they don't necessarily comment. And we don't have any ill feelings toward each other. They just are not commenters. They are followers. And the, the crazy part is when they say, I actually own your books or I tune in and go back and watch the replays, but there's just not commenters. So uh, not taking some of that personal, but if you get in a, in a to a point where you just feel that you do have a change in your circle, that's fine as well. I'm not nearly as social as I used to be. And for people who actually know me, I was voted friendliest in high school. So I'm talking super social. I'm still a very, you know, nice and kind person and all those things. But um, sorry, I don't think you came in. Um, but I am not a I, I am not um out in the public eye as more because where the point I'm in right now demands more private time. It demands more intimacy. Now, when I see my folks out in public, you know what's going down. Sis is always excited to see you, and I look forward to that. But the other part about that is if you're also working in this arena, it actually demands that we come in contact with people a lot. It demands that we work with folks a lot. And, and so as a result, it also requires us to have time to decompress and go into that private time so that we can kind of refocus and, and just get yes. back to ourselves. So go ahead, Sean. Uh, I, want, I want to say something before, before we have to ride out and close out, right? But like, I want to interject something with this conversation about social, right? Back to the people that want to meet us at Starbucks and talk about this whole book project that they have in their mind, right? Mm -hmm. If I ask them, what's their social media like? And you barely follow people. People barely follow you. You don't post videos. You don't go live. You don't really post. How do you plan on getting this in front of people? Mm -hmm. And I, I, it's, it's the weirdest thing in the world. A lot of us writers, well, not me, but a lot of writers are actually introverts. And that's fine, but you got to realize the power of putting yourself in front of people. Yeah. Because to buy your product, they got to feel like they like you. They got to feel like they know you and trust you to spend money with you. It's like no trust. Mm -hmm. I learned this a few years ago. So I do videos on a daily. If you follow my page, I do daily videos. As a part of my daily discipline, no matter what, at some point in the day, I'm doing a video about something every day. It, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to cultivate you to, well, I, I trust, when I see that name on the screen, I trust him, yep. good information, yep. not derogatory, not cursing never the word, being yep. positive. I, so when the, when the book come out, they click it easier on the link, because I, I trust him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So you got you guys not cultivating that that audience, man. And I'll tell you, like, if those of you who follow me, so I don't post every single day. Uh, during the summer, I'm a lot more active. My time is a little bit different um, in the fall just because I have different demands. And for those of you who know, you know, I'm also still trying to work some things out health-wise. So for me, right now, you don't necessarily see me every day. But uh, it'll be even be so much to where my social media is hooked to, you know, like Yahoo News and stuff. So you may see me shoot an article to my account, even if it's not so much a video or something like that. But something shows up in your feed to show that I'm, I have ongoing communication. Uh, at one point on TikTok, I was on TikTok every day. So for me now, even if I can get in about two days a week and two days a week, I'm hitting 10 or 20 videos in that two day period. And it doesn't have to all be original content. I'm duetting people, sharing yeah. people with good knowledge. I'm yeah. um, stitching information. Uh, then that's been one way that I've been able to continue to build up and support and work that community. So it, it comes down to those types of things. You know, I understand that we have people who are definitely say I'm quiet. I'm an introvert, but you have to dig into that aspect of yourself and work this market a little bit. Somebody really just wants to be seen tonight because no, um, you know he's like the young king. What's going on, Lee? Mr. Lee. Um, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. But so, um, but, yeah, but 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 like we do all the interviews, right? Mm -hmm. That's again, yeses and noes. I've had a lot of noes from different authors, not because they don't want to go on my platform or do it. They are really, really afraid of the camera. Believe it or not, they are really afraid to go on this camera and press that record button. Yeah. Yes. And it's like, I don't know how you're going to sell your product if you're not really comfortable, you know, popping out, coming out, because you're going to need it. Because guess what? Like, as, as a consumer, whenever I watch an author interview on TV or something, I might not plan on buying your book, but you say something that's so profound or so interesting. I'm like, wow, now I want to buy the book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So me doing author interviews, I'm giving mm -hmm. you a chance for an hour or whatever it is to, yes. to, to do your best, your best pitch. Yes, exactly. 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 So that's some that's some of the some of the situations. Yeah. They're about to keep me out the dog on coffee shop. They're about to keep me out of here, friend. I'm about to ride out. I'm okay, so we want to tell you guys, uh, if you yeah. got a log off, Sean, go ahead. We want to first thank you so much for coming tonight and for being so absolutely amazing. You guys, I'm going to post the links to our social uh, social media yes. for Sean. Please follow him. I'm going to also post the links thank to his book. Man. And we'll be engaging with you guys. Um, And, yeah. and we'll be coming for a part two in the future. Yeah, we, we got to. We got to. Too good. Yeah, yeah, Too good. yeah. So Too good. thank you so much. And I'm going to go ahead and close things. Thank y'all. You have a great night. Be safe. Okay. Thank you guys so much for tuning in tonight. So happy to have Sean here. And some of the things he shared were just so insightful as well. And, and just when you talk about relationships, you guys, when Jonathan and I met, we had not spoken at the time. We had only, I had only uh, got the appointment to a woman named Yvonne, uh, who I met at another event, but Jonathan and I had never talked. We built that relationship that night. Um, you know, he felt really impressed by the work I was doing. I was impressed by the profound questions he was asking. And from there, we connected and we have just kept in touch since then. And we haven't had the chance to see each other in person since then. So what I'm saying to you is this. It's all about you putting in the work to build those relationships with people that you feel offer meaningful resources and information and continue to move forward with that with any platform that you're doing. We thank you guys so much for joining us on a Friday night. Jonathan will be coming back. I'll be posting all of his information in the comments. Please, by all means, follow him. Check out his books. Um, and everything that, that he has talked about tonight. We thank you guys for joining us and have a fantastic night. And we will see you guys on the next conversation with the Black Intellectualism Movement. Take care. <laughs>